Firstly, the father confers primary identity. Secondly, the father confers secondary identity. Where do we get our secondary identity from? Obviously, we get it from the past, the present, and the future. You are not only what you have been in the past. You are who you are now and what you associate now with. And you are what you dream for and what you will become. And therefore, the fathers will have to teach themselves, their family, what identity is in the past, the present, and the future. Which means the following. You have to walk with your child through the past and filter the past. I had to walk with my children through the past of South Africa, the apartheid past. I had to walk them. Actually, I had to go much further back because my grandfather fought in the Anglo-Boer War against my wife's great-grandfather. So who are they? Are they the Afrikaners come from, coming from my background? Are they the British coming from my wife's background? So I had to walk the past through them, even from the Anglo-Boer War. That's more difficult. Through the apartheid years into the present and say, from the past, these are things that we adopt and these are things we discard. Very clearly, we made the decision to discard the atrocities of the apartheid years. And they knew their decision, who they are, has to do with how they dealt with the past. Then in the present. In the present, there are three things that are very important for your identity in the present. Firstly, the values that you associate with and that you choose as your primary values. The friends that you choose. And thirdly, the choices that you make on all six dimensions of the human being. Let me run through this quickly. The values that you choose. At one stage, when my youngest biological daughter was three years old, I facilitated a meeting of the family by asking them what are the most important values that we will align our lives to. My three-year-old daughter put up her hand and she said, Dad, what are values? So I simplified it by saying, values are just the things that are most important to us. Her hand shut up immediately again. Oh, I know, I know. We must serve the poor children. It was the shock of my life. I never thought of that as a primary value. So I asked the other children, and lo and behold, consensus around the table. We must serve the poor children. That day, it is now 20 years ago, we adopted serving poor people as one of the five top key values of our family. It dramatically changed our lives forever. That day, we also chose other values. And those values were given in priority, and then we would make all the decisions related to the value. For instance, spiritual growth, high value, which meant that if the child had to run in a sport competition and do a spiritual camp, and there would be a conflict between the two, the child would say to the teacher, Sir, I am so sorry, but taking part in sport is not one of our top five values. But spiritual growth is one of the top five. Therefore, I will have to go to the camp and not represent represent the school in this competition. Massive conflict with the value system of the school. But they knew who they were and everything was aligned according to these values. You will not know who you are unless you can say these are the five most important things that practically determine all the decisions in life. Values determine decisions. Decisions determine behavior. And that's why the set of values that you choose is the most important to determine your identity. Secondly, the friends that you choose. Now, this is important even when the children are small. Obviously, more important when they enter the group adventure phase or the teenage phase, as we call it. And therefore, to help them to choose the right friends, absolutely essential. How do you choose your friends? What are the value systems that they live with? What are the things that you can contribute to their lives? What friend do you want to be to them, not what they want to be to you? These are things that help them to choose the right friends that they would surround their lives with. My children know from my life that my table of life is surrounded by nine chairs around my life that are filled with key people. And these key people demonstrate who I am. There is my hero. In my case, Mother Therese, Nelson Mandela, and a few others from the Bible, Daniel. He sits on the one chair. 
Then there is my mentor. I've got three. They sit on this chair. They know who the people are that give me wisdom in life. Then we have my coach. This is someone training me in a specific skill. Speaking skill, writing skill, sports skill, whatever it is. That person is there. Then there is my mentee. I am the mentor of this person. I have 24 of them, but that chair must be filled. You must have a mentee. Then you must have two soulmates at least. Those are people that you share everything with. You can share your fears, your stress, all the emotional baggage that you carry. You can share it with them. They are soulmates, two of them. Then there is a family member on the other chair. Family member that is also a soulmate. Not all in the family are soulmates, but this one you can share everything with. Then you have the validator. This is a very important person in your life. Because you, li you live life with a purpose, and when you finish life, you hand over the baton to this per person that will take your dream or your mission and complete it for you. You cannot die without having a person like this. You must have a validator in your life. That chair is filled by a specific person. And then there is a very interesting chair around the table of my life. And this is a chair of a um, cross-cultural person. This is someone that is just totally, totally different. In our context, someone of another race. Could be even your enemy that you invite to sit at the chair of your life. Why? Because you must have one person that teaches you something that no one else can teach you. And it's a great thing to embrace your enemy, to teach you certain things in life. If your children know that their life will be surrounded by this enormous, power, enormously powerful group of people speaking into your life and keeping you accountable, then their lives will be surrounded by the best people possible and that will secure their identity for them. And then, lastly, identity in the present are the choices that you make. Choices that you make physically. Do I choose to be fat or do I choose to be fit? Or handsome or whatever you choose. What do you choose? You've got to live and you've got to help your child to live by these choices. Socially, who are the friends? Um, who do they help? Who do they mentor? Social environment. Emotionally, how do they deal with their emotions? Intellectually, what are the books that they read? What are the wisdom literature that they adopt? Environment, how, what do you do with money and culture and things like this? Spiritually, all these dimensions, you have different choices to make and that determines your identity. Identity is past, it's filter the past. Identity is present, values, friends and choices. Identity is future. Future is your life mission statement, the dream you live for, the calling that you have which we have already talked about. But that is your future because you become that. You become your calling. And that uh, identifies who you are in the process of living life. My daughter was 16 years old when she did camps for 13-year-old girls on purpose and identity. You can learn this very early in life. I believe at 10 and 11 years old, every child should know this is my purpose and this is my identity. I'm so secure in this. And therefore I can enter the teenager phase. And then not only feel established in my identity. But also confer some identity into this identityless group that I sometimes enter. I think you want to make your child a leader amongst others. Best way to do it. Confer identity to your child. And your child will know who he or she is. And they will establish and do that imprint also on the peer group.